What a treat to be with you again. Last time I was with you, I was meeting with the search team. And I must say, search team, I think you did a mighty fine job. I'm very excited. So welcome, Nathan and Camilla. It's uh, nice to meet you first time. Are you familiar with the Evangelical Free Church? (laughs) So I'm especially glad to be here this morning. Uh, As I get myself arranged here, uh, this is... uh, Actually, uh, earned an uh, anniversary celebration weekend for my wife and I. Karen is able to travel with me during the summer. So 43 years with this wonderful woman. She's largely responsible for the five kids that we have and uh, seven grandkids. Uh, Karen is, uh, uh, is a seventh grade language arts teacher, so she's busy during the school year. So she begins this week. Uh, back at school, so it's nice to have this weekend with her. And she's also uh, a Bible, you know, a BSF, she's a Bible Study Fellowship uh, teaching leader for a Jacksonville evening uh, women's class, and so that keeps her busy as well. So this is our last weekend together, so when I got invited to come speak on this weekend, uh, once I heard what the topic was, I was all in. Uh, any other topic, I mean, as many topics as there are before us in the Word, uh, but uh, I love talking about the free church of what it, because of what it means to me. Um, I began going to the Evangelical Free Church December 18th, 1971. Now, I know many of you are thinking, well, he's probably born into it. Now, I was a little bit older than that at that particular time. But I'd like to think that my story mirrors the story of the Evangelical Free Church of America. Give you a little backstory here of... Uh, of where the free church came from. Let's start with who we are right now. So right now, the Evangelical Free Church of America is an association of churches across the United States that numbers over 1,300 evangelical free churches. We're called by EV Free or the Free Church, EFCA, uh, all kinds of names that we're called. Those over 1,300 churches are divided into 17 districts, of which I get to oversee the Southeast District, which is nine states of the Southeast. Now, that's huge geography, but we call ourselves the Siberia of the Free Church. (laughs) Because we have huge geography, but very few settlements or very few churches. Half of our churches are in Florida. The other half are scattered around the other eight states. And uh, and we number 100 ministries, 70 churches, and 30 church plants currently underway. Uh, So that's who we are as a district, the Southeast District, one of 17 of 1,300 churches. Uh, over nationally, there are 100, about 130 church plants going on right now. Each week, the number is 360,000 of us gathered as a weekly, a weekly attenders in the Evangelical Free Church. That averages out to about 225 uh, per church, which it actually uh, makes the Evangelical Free Church of America a large church denomination. Uh, we have 200 chaplains. 50 of them are military chaplains, and another 150 are institutional chaplains, like uh, hospitals and things of that sort. Uh, We have three divisions. I'm trying to get this stuff out of the way so I can really get to my favorite part of the story. Uh, We're divided this way in really three departments, we'll say. There's the Office of the President. Kevin Complin is our sixth president. He's been serving us for three years now. And, And our headquarters is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We have what's called Reach National. And there we have a team that oversees the the national ministries, those within the boundaries of the U.S., of which our district, of course, would fall under. And then we have what's called Reach Global, and that's our international ministry. We have 611 missionaries. Our son happens to be one of them in Mexico City. We were visiting him about 10 days ago. Uh, And we're in 48 countries. Part of Reach Global is our crisis response team that some of you might have heard about. And so in the last 12 12 months or so, they responded to five world crisis events from the hurricanes to the floods to the earthquakes, and so they respond. And 118 church teams have been out, have been sent out in the last 12 months just to serve those in crisis. And and the first goal is to come alongside any evangelical free church, of course, to start with the family and come alongside them and then work through them to be able to serve those communities that are affected. Now, the EFCA um, has a conference that meets every other year called uh, EFCA One. 
And that's where pastors and leaders, delegates come every other year. And that's where the business of our association is done. Electing a president, if there's any changes that need to be made at the, at the big picture. They also have a theology conference that happens every year, Nathan. And you're more than invited. And uh, the next one's going to be in the Chicago area in the very early part of February. So a different theological uh, uh, issue is, is picked, and then they invite speakers to come in, and then we come and, and enjoy that. Now, our district also has a conference every year. It's called SEDCON, Southeast District Conference. So SEDCON uh, meets every year at different places and different times. And then the, really the sale of really all of our ministry, all of our, our district's ministries, and our district in particular, is what's called RPMs, or regional pastor meetings. And so, Nathan, you're invited to join those regional pastor meetings. There's 10 of them in our district. And so in January, in May, and in October, I put them all, kind of cram them all in there, and I just travel uh, the breadth of the district meeting with that. So that's just, so those are some of the, that's some of the, the skeleton of, uh, of the free church and who we are in that way. Like I said, I'd like to think that my story mirrors the EFCA story. And it may be your story uh, as well. Uh, my story begins in, uh, in a small town in Nebraska. Uh, Columbus, Nebraska is where I grew up. It's on the eastern part of that state. And in my neighborhood, uh, three doors down was a chiropractor. And that chiropractor, um, I really enjoyed he and his family because they were one of the first ones to get a basketball hoop in their driveway. And they didn't mind me playing on their basketball hoop at all. And I didn't have a basketball. They would let me have the ball any time I wanted to go over. So, so I got to meet Doc Nelson that way. And then he moved out, and then a, a junior high principal moved in. And I liked him, too, because he kept the basketball hoop there, and he let me continue to play. And he even opened up the junior high for me to go play uh, on weekends. And so, of course, uh, my affinity for him was similar to Doc Nelson and enjoyed that. Well, I knew that uh, these two families went to this church that I rode my bicycle by on the way to an elementary school, and the church's name was Highland Park Evangelical Free Church. What a long and strange name that was. Now, I grew up in church. I went to uh, a larger denomination that you would know, and uh, so I was at church regularly, and, but this church, just I didn't know what to make of it, but I knew those people, and I knew their kids, and I liked them a lot. And then there was a math teacher, and that math teacher uh, also uh, went to that church, and he taught me how to play tennis, and he was the basketball coach, and so he befriended me and, uh, and his kids as well, so I enjoyed that. And then going into the senior, uh, my, my senior year in high school, uh, there was a football coach who was also the social studies teacher. And he started a Fellowship of Christian Athletes group. And if you've heard my testimony here before, and I think you have, I thought I was a Christian and I thought I was an athlete. And so I went, uh, only to find out I was neither. And they, were, and they were able to help me with the one. But so my story goes to, to these lay folks that love the Lord, that use their their driveways and their places of work and their time and their talents to be able to befriend and influence their spheres uh, for the Lord. And they just lived the joy and the light of the Lord. And so when I thought of that church, I thought of them, and they ended up introducing me to the holy God that we sang about. And, and Ross and Charlie and the team, I really enjoyed that song, Holy God. Uh, so thank you for that. And so that football coach on, uh, on, on, uh, on a Monday morning uh, cornered me in the bathroom, and I was a long-haired hippie freak at the, at the time, and, and I was probably dealing with my acne, and he came in and he noticed my obvious depression. I won't get into the reasons why. And he said very simply, he said, Glenn, you want to get full of joy? And I go, boy, I sure do. Because I was having some issues, but I thought church would be the last place that my issues would really be handled. He says, well, come to my house tonight. And his wife opened up their house to a traveling evangelist that was going through town. And that evangelist, uh, so I went that evening, that evangelist handed out 3 by 5 cards. In the 3 by 5 cards, he asked, how does one become a Christian? Write that down as we get prepared to continue on. So I wrote down, uh, go to church regularly, live by the golden rule, Obey the Ten Commandments. 
Thought I had it nailed. Succinct yet thorough. Handed it in. Couldn't wait to, to, to hear all the kudos about my tremendous answer. As he was reading the answers and explaining the gospel as he was going through, he got to mine, started to read it, started to shake his head. What are you shaking your head for? It's a great answer. And he goes, I don't think this person's a Christian. What do you mean I'm not a Christian? And as he shared the gospel and he shared the word and the truths there that I was familiar with but hadn't heard it quite the way he did, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, started to speak to my spirit and convict me of the sin and the things that I had gotten away with. And, 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 he, and he reiterated the fact that there's nothing that we can do for our salvation. My going to church, I didn't go to church every Sunday. My living by the golden rule, I didn't think of others first all the time. And living by the, by the Ten Commandments, okay, well, I fudged a few, probably more than a few. So the Holy Spirit was convicting me of all of that, of my need. But he also said three other things. He said to me, he said, God knows you by name. He loves you enough to die for you. And he has a plan and purpose for your life that only you can fulfill. So this skinny, long hair hippie freak kid that didn't think he had a chance in the world to make it in life uh, heard that message that night. And again, his spirit speaking to my spirit through the word of God being presented through that evangelist, my life turned upside down. It went from black and white to color uh, that evening uh, as, 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 as I was born again, literally given a new life. Well, in the, in the 1800s, there in, in northern Europe, in the Scandinavian countries in particular, there was, there was a revival taking place among the laity, among those uh, sitting in the pews of the stately churches, and there was a state church. <clears throat> if you were born into that country, you were born into that church, and you lived by the rituals and by the form of religion. And yet there wasn't any true spirituality, true function uh, in those lives necessarily until a thing happened. <clears throat> this word of God that was now being printed in the common language was being distributed around so that anyone could read the word of God. As people began to read the word of God, there in the pews, so to speak, the Holy Spirit started to work in their life like the Holy Spirit worked in my life. That, that brought them to an awareness of what the true gospel was and how it was a personal relationship with Christ, not this corporate state thing, and they started to give their lives to Christ, one by one, by tens and, and on. Well, this new life, like myself, it went from black and white to color for them as well, and so they started to, to gather with others that were having a similar experience, a, a revival taking place. And interestingly, it was called the Small F Free Church Movement at that time, because it wasn't from the state church that this, uh, or from the organized church that this took place, but from the laity that then started to form themselves uh, in gatherings free from that state church. And so they would gather to have Bible studies. They would gather to, to have baptisms. They would gather to do communion. And, and they, would, they would start sharing their faith apart from the clergy and the state church of that particular time. Well, of course, the clergy didn't like what was going on. And so, because they were a part of the state, they declared it illegal to be doing and associating and things of that sort. But the verse that I picked for today that we could, go, that we could look at, uh, New Bible. I love New Bibles. Don't you love New Bibles? Oh, I just got, and then I get it, and I start turning, and I go and start underlining all my favorite passages. One of the first ones that I went to, one that you're hopefully familiar with, is the Great Commission. So it was these verses that led me to Christ as lived out by those laymen and that pastor in that local evangelical free church in my hometown. And it's this passage that then led me into ministry so that I could be a part of the same. And it reads like this, from verse 16 I'll begin. He says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. I love the reality of the of the scriptures here. Some doubted. But then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, Ho in the, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It was this commission that those believers 
back in the 1800s, mid-1800s, wanted to live out. They wanted to go make disciples. They wanted to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They wanted to continue to, to teach others uh, to obey the commands of Jesus. And they acknowledged that the Holy Spirit uh, was going to be with them uh, and, and, and help them in that witness. And yet the state kept uh, persecuting them and putting them down. And so for freedom of mission ex- expression and Christian faith expression, uh, they, they left the Scandinavian countries and they came to America, and this was in the, again, the mid to late 1800s that this, took, this migration took place. Of course, by this time in the United States, the eastern seaboard had already been uh, populated, and so they, they immigrated over to the Midwest and to the upper Midwest. They're used to the north, uh, and so uh, that's where they, they immigrated to. And, uh, and that's where their mission expression started to take place as they were able to freely share about their faith in Christ, disciple others, start churches, and, and continue to multiply themselves out. Uh, and it's that same, it's that, it's that particular uh, commissioning and vision that they had that brought them to the States that started that church in Columbus, Nebraska, that then had a pastor that, that, that realized it's not just my job as a pastor to do this work, but I'm going to equip those in the pews, you know, every person uh, to be able to, was a minister for God, to be able to reach out into the community to which my life was reached, and I got incorporated into that. And so I came to Christ on Monday night, December 12th, 1971, as a senior in high school. My first time in that Highland Park Evangelical Free Church was December 18th, that next Sunday, to where those same coaches and teachers and everyone around discipled me and encouraged me in the Lord and, uh, and actually encouraged me to go into full-time Christian work and to continue uh, to, uh, to play out this great commission. So the backstory of the free church is one out of revival. It's one out of a personal relationship with God. It's one out of, of acknowledging the word of God and it alone is the authority for our Christian life and our Christian practice. Acknowledging the Holy Spirit with this word that gives life to us and they wanted to be able to, to live out that expression. And so as these, as these uh, families started to come to America uh, and get away from the, the state church, uh, they started to gather in huddles all around from, from the northeast and then over into the Midwest largely. And, and as they gathered, they found, you know, we're not the only ones that have come there. There are others that have come. So you had the Swedes, the, the Norwegians, and the Danes uh, primarily that were coming into America from this revival at that time. And so they would start to gather with each other. And they thought, you know, there's a couple things that we can do better together than we can do on our own. And again, because of the state church and the hold that they had, they didn't necessarily want to just form some organization or some denomination that was top down. And so they guarded the, they guarded the fact that they could, that they as a local group of believers could kind of govern their own church and, and determine how they went. But they did again think, well, we can do better together though if we join with these other huddles that are meeting or churches that are meeting. And so they gathered around two common denominators, where I like to say the word denomination comes for ourselves. And that was around mission, continue to be a part of this great commission, and the idea of training for ministry. If we come together and train each other for ministry, we can continue to live out uh, what we came to America for. And so those common denominators of of, of of mission and sending out missionaries and church planters and the idea of training uh, everyone for, for the sake of ministry, uh, they gathered together and formed what was called uh, the Evangelical Free Church. And so in 1884, just some dates to, to, uh, to throw your way, uh, in uh, 1884, the Swedes started to gather and that's where they officially formed the Evangelical Free Church of America. In 1912, the Norwegians and the Danes gathered together and they formed uh, the official uh, organ association uh, of an evangelical free church. And then in 1950, those two groups came together to form what we know today as the Evangelical Free Church of America. So 1950 is when that took place. Again, we're largely in the Midwest, upper Midwest. We have, again, our headquarters in Minneapolis. But part of that 
part of the, the common denominator was training. And so that's where uh, the schools that we have started. So we have one of the, the best seminaries in the world. Sorry, yours is good too. Um, <laughs> But uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and Trinity International University are just north of Chicago, and they've, uh, they've been training up ministers and, and, and others uh, for years now, and I was privileged to be able to go to that, that particular school. And so, again, training is good. We actually have a satellite campus, uh, South Florida campus, uh, there near, uh, actually it's in Miramar, I believe now, uh, Florida. So that's the, the training. So... I want you to catch a bit of who we are uh, today, where we came from, kind of how my story mirrors that. And uh, now what I'd like to share is just follow. So, so what is the common theology that we have? Um, I'm not going to go through, through uh, every, every article, but when they started to gather, they said, well, we'd like to gather. We do think we're better together, but let's come up with some sort of a statement of faith that we can all agree to. And uh, let's make it, make it basic. And so we kind of call it the meat and potatoes of, 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 our, uh, of our Christian theology is laid out in 10 articles of our Christian faith. Uh, this book was written, I don't know if you've seen this yet, Nathan. It's called Evangelical Convictions, uh, the, Theolo- the Theological Exposition of the Statement of Faith of the EFCA. So you can Amazon this and find it, I'm sure. Um, but Evangelical Convictions goes article by article and explains what it is we believe is very readable, but to the, the basic meat and potatoes of, of, what our, of what our statement of faith is. It begins with God, theology proper, goes to the Bible, then the human condition. Uh, man, is, you know, man is sinful, uh, fell from, uh, from uh, uh, the position that God originally created us in. Then we go to Jesus Christ, the work of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and we talk about the church, Christian living, Christ's return, and then what our response should be in our eternal destiny. So that's laid out here in in the book, and it's spelled out more uh, as you go through its pages. So I offer that to anyone that would like to to look at that. And uh, and then also you can go to efca.org. And you can just surf that and find that there and, and look up other things. But here are some of the distinctives that we have as a free church. We do have this common theology, that statement of faith. But here's what's interesting about the free church. I bet if we took a poll here, and I can certainly, I've, I've done it at other churches, you know, what are your different church backgrounds? There will probably be few that actually have been born and raised in the free church. Many, like myself and my wife, we come from competing uh, religious backgrounds, and we met in evangelical Protestantism. Uh, but you would find that we end up becoming the free church becomes a refuge uh, haven for for a lot of folks from other uh, denominations because they have a story like mine, where they get you know they're, they're in college or high school, they find their faith, and then they go, well, what what church should I go to? And because of our basic statement of faith, they find the evangelical free church as a good place to go. But let me read this. The EFC uh, acknowledges differences in areas of evangelical theology that aren't specifically addressed by our statement of faith. And we embrace those with grace for those within the fellowship. And that in our denomination, we do have people that have various views on what we call non-essentials of the faith. So in essentials, which would we outline in, the, in our statement of faith, we would say we don't want to have unity in those. But in non-essentials, uh, we there say, well, let's give each other charity. Uh, let's give each other grace uh, when it comes to those particular issues. One of the things that guides our theology in the free church is we ask the question, where stands it written? Because we take the Bible as being our authority, We ask, well, where stands it written? So if someone comes up with a particular view or an issue or whatever, well, let's see what the Word says about that. And then we dig in, and so we encourage people to keep coming back uh, to the Word. Again, we want to major on the majors and minor on the minors. And uh, there's one thing, there's one statement in the free church that, that has continued to make us unique. This is the idea that we... Uh, it's the phrase called the significance of silence. And let me just read this, this statement. Uh, once, the early, uh, the early 
uh, free church leaders began to put into writing what was commonly believed among them, they were silent on those doctrines which through the centuries had divided Christians of equal dedication, biblical knowledge, spiritual maturity, and love for Christ. So you can probably think of some issues in yourself that you've had disagreement with others or you think one way someone else thinks another, but you're both equally dedicated to the Lord. You both, uh, you both seek to find what the Word has to say on that. You're both mature in Christ and you love the Lord. And yet we don't want to divide over those particular non-essentials, though they're, it's a conviction of yours. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be something of, of actual faith, uh, of, of uh, um, a saving faith. And so, so that we've, we've uh, used the term significance of silence in that, particular, uh, in that particular area. So that's our common theology. Where stands it written? Major on the majors and a significance of silence. Now, I've already alluded to our common mission. This is the Great Commission. This is Acts 1-8, where the disciples were told, just wait, the Holy Spirit will come, but when He comes, uh, then you will have the power to be able to be a witness to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so with that Great Commission uh, commandment, or command, and then with the Holy Spirit empowerment, uh, we seek to be on mission with the Lord. Uh, And so one of our one of the things that we challenge each other with uh, as a congregation by congregation is how is our Great Commission health? Uh, are we uh, following the Lord's command to want to be able to make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching and going forward? Are we seeking to be witnesses throughout our spheres of influence? That's our common mission. Common theology, statement of faith. Common mission, the Great Commission, Acts 1.8. Then there's a common attitude that hopefully you've heard uh, me speak of as, we've gone, uh, as I've gone through uh, this morning. But uh, we have, again, this unity that's based on essentials, coupled with freedom and charity for non-essentials. Uh, we believe that uh, we want to be evangelical in our theology and our practice. We want to cooperate with others who are advancing the cause of Christ. One of the things that's unique about the Evangelical Free Church, which I appreciate it, Ross and Margaret, you might have appreciated it too, is we were on staff with a parachurch organization. We would find that Evangelical Free Churches were, uh, were encouraging us to just come and present who we were in front of that congregation uh, because we were a part of this mission. Where some denominations, you know, it's only going to be, well, if you're with our group, then we'll support you, but if you're from outside, you're not. Well, we have such a kingdom a partnership mentality that we want to partner with anybody that's about the business of, of the Great Commission like we are. Um, we teach liberty in Christ with responsibility and accountability, though. We, we, uh, I'll use the term legalism. We, we're not a, a legalistic associational group. We want to give liberty to those uh, uh, in their, uh, in their the practice of, in their, in their Christian life or practice, but still accountable to the Lord and, and acknowledging that you need to be responsible with that liberty. Um, we look seek a balanced teaching ministry that engages both the mind and the heart. And we seek an interdependence through the working of the larger body of Christ. What I mean by that is, even though you are... Well, let me, hold, let me lead right into the common polity. So there's a common polity. Polity is governance. Church governance. So rather than the state church that's going to, uh, that's going to uh, tell you how to conduct your services and who to have as your pastor and things of that sort, uh, in the free church, uh, every individual free church has the freedom under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to govern its own affairs in accordance with the mind of Christ and His Word. And so in that local autonomy that you have to where in the denomination that I grew up, my position would be bishop. And I would have power to appoint who was to be the pastor and who were to be different things. And, and we would probably have ownership over this building and this, and this property. Not so in the Evangelical Free Church. I have no power. Um, it's only by, by a power of influence uh, that this position has. And it's the power resides in your local congregation. And, and your power as local congregation it comes from a church membership. And a church membership that is given to those who have saving faith um, that want to join this membership. And as, that, as your membership gathers together, that's the highest form of authority under Christ 
that you have as a church to govern. Now, part of the authority that you have as a membership is to recognize that there are gifted leaders that God has given. And those leaders are then to be identified, acknowledged, and appointed to then lead your congregation within the parameters that your constitution and bylaws that you have agreed on go. So it's a mutual accountability of the membership of the church with the leadership that you have affirmed and put in place, and then that leadership is accountable to the membership, uh, and it's just a kind of a cycle like that with that mutual accountability. So that's the common polity that we have. And I, and I swung from, from that, that last section to this section to say that as a local autonomous church, um, you don't have to do anything that the larger national free church is about or that the district free church is about uh, because you have the decision to do that. But because you have volunteered to become a part of this association, uh, we hope and encourage this interdependence that we have uh, rather than an independence, an interdependence to join in with uh, the the crisis response that's being taken place in, in some part of the of our nation or the world, or part of the mission, the missions that's going on, or the church planting that's taking place, you have an opportunity to join with other churches, proving again that we're better together uh, to be able to to impact our world for Christ. So that's the common polity portion of that of that each local congregation can serve itself. Uh, and doesn't need someone from outside. And then that takes us to the common commitments, which I've, uh, which I've also just alluded to. The fact that you as a local church will be willing to cooperate with other free churches that are other local churches in the area. And that you as a local congregation will consider what the district is trying to accomplish. For example, we've, uh, I just have a new ministry partner uh, that, sp- that will help us with our Spanish ministries. And so I'd love for you to be able to, to see what Ugo is able to bring in far as expanding our sphere of influence among Spanish speakers that are in our, that are in our ministry domain. And of course, National has different opportunities uh, that uh, will be presented. Again, you don't have to do these, but we present them to you to say, hey, if we, the more we can join together, the more we can go. And then, of course, uh, in missions across, uh, across the way. The, the last uh, thing you have, I believe, in your, in your bulletin is what our president, Kevin Conflin, put together. And I'll, and I'll leave us with this. Uh, uh, he said, I really tried to put in an infographic who we are as the free church. And so at the top, we have our mission statement, which is we exist to glorify God by multiplying transformational churches among all people. He says, how do we get there? He says, well, our foundation stones, you know, uh, is the word abide, John 15. Apart from God, we can do nothing. The word of God, the gospel, mission, community, unity, all those things that hopefully you've heard me speak about. Taking those foundation stones we build by wanting to multiply disciple makers, extend gospel ministry, strengthening, revitalizing, and planting churches. All as we're appreciating the past that got us here, but focusing on the future about how we want to continue to bring in more and more of the glens that are out there uh, needing to to hear a word from the Lord and uh, being brought into the life of a local church and then hopefully launched out into whatever ministry God might be calling them. So uh, the Great Commission to be a witness to the nations. That's what brought the the free church into being and that's what continues to send the free church on. I hopefully wanted to personalize it today because that's a lot of what the free church is. It's a family on mission rather than a bureaucracy that's organized and uh, and cares about the, the nuts and bolts. Let me pray for us and then send us on further into the into the, the morning. Father, thank you for what you have worked in my life and how you have used the Evangelical Free Church uh, to bring me to the awareness of who I am in you. Father, I pray for this congregation that has similar designs. Father, they came into being from a free church that wanted to expand their influence. Father, may this congregation, especially with, uh, uh, with their new leadership, uh, continue to seek your will and your way and give you all the glory. What an amazing and holy God you are. In Jesus' name, amen.